Good afternoon. We are at Jesus is Lord Ministries International in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And the message title for tonight is The Power of Divine Love. It's a, it's a book that Pastor Mike's going to put out soon, and I'm going to give you some testimonies. But for this evening, I'm going to talk about... Last week I said that I would go through 1 Corinthians. We'd go through that line by line, and I would give you commentary. And I know I was speaking by the Spirit, but the commentary looked different than what I thought when I left last week. So I'm still going to do that, go through 1 Corinthians as the backdrop here, but the commentary is going to be a series of testimonies that I give you to show you what actually is being uh, given to us here in 1 Corinthians by inspiration of God. So I'll open in prayer and then we'll get started. Father, I thank you for this message, for the royal law and the power, the power within divine love, because God is love. You are love, Father. I thank you that this message will not return void. And as I stand behind the pulpit, I ask you to fill my mouth with your words. I ask, God, I ask for a spirit of love and compassion to come over me as this message goes forth this evening. And I'm asking you to use the message that you gave to me, that you put on my heart, to inspire the body of Christ to seek after a baptism of fire and a baptism of love. That we can fulfill the royal law in our lives. Because it's a law, it's your law, Father. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer that you are going to answer it. So I am going to read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I am going to give you a commentary. The commentary is going to be a series of testimonies. I can't get done with all the testimonies that I have for this topic. They're miraculous. And I started to make a list of them this week. And there's no way I can give them all to you, especially tonight when I, wanna, I want you to hear 1 Corinthians 13 as the starting point. That's where we ended last week. So I would encourage you to go back and listen to last week's message. It was titled, The Royal Law. And then listen to this message the power of divine love, and then Friday at 2 p.m., 2 in the afternoon, I'm going to come in and I'm going to start to give you the rest of my testimonies, and I probably won't be able to get done with all of those either. Now, <clears throat> why are testimonies important? They're not my testimonies. They're God's testimonies, God working in us. In Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, chapter 12, verse 11, and they overcame him, that's an important phrase, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved, they loved it not their lives unto the death. That's why this is important. Now I can stand up here and teach Every week, I can preach the gospel to you. God said he would confirm the word, the preaching, with signs, wonders, and miracles. And he does that. I believe that. I've seen it over and over and over again. God cannot lie. But if I can't give you testimonies that I am a doer of the word as a teacher of the Holy Bible, for you to hear the word, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and then give you testimonies to show you that God says what he means, and he means what he says, 
then am I going to sound any different than anyone getting up here that isn't even a believer in Christ and giving you a scripture out of the Bible? Because as a minister, as an apostle, as a prophet, as an evangelist, as a pastor and teacher, as a leader in the church, you are only going to be able to edify and lift up the flock assigned to you to the level of faith that you operate in. Now, I was taught here. This is an apostolic training center. So I have a lot of testimonies of God working in me, miraculous, and I was taught how to move in the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Spirit. That is where God will confirm. When God confirms the Word with signs, wonders, and miracles, if we don't allow, if we don't allow the preacher or if the preacher doesn't move in the gifts and he doesn't have an altar call, the message leading to an altar call, the body of Christ is in a classroom. But we're in the house of God. It's God's house, and in His house, the miraculous should be the everyday. But more than not, the pastors, the ministers... They're not moving in the gifts of the Spirit. They, they, and, and don't take me wrong. The, in the Bible, the Holy Bible, God has recorded 28 different levels of faith. Every believer has faith because they had to have faith to make that confession on Christ. It's what level are you operating at? I've been used of God to lay hands on the sick and they recover in the working of miracles where words of knowledge with divine downloads, words of knowledge, divine downloads, words of prophecy and divine downloads from God, divine wisdom just flows out of my belly as a river of living water, but there's a price you have to pay to do that. You have to be taught, number one. You have to be a doer of the word, and you have to have the faith to step into that realm. Now, when I go through 1 Corinthians, which I'm going to do shortly, I want you to keep in mind several things. We're talking about God's love, agape love, divine love. Remember... We were created in the image of God, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. What is God's image? What is his nature? His very essence, God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, I'm sorry, verse 8 and verse 16. Now, if I was created in the image of God to be conformed after Jesus Christ, who is the express image of the Father, how's that going to happen? I can pray, but the Bible tells me to do some things. And that's what I want to share with you before I give you the testimonies. So first off, the Gospel according to John, chapter 13, verse 35. The words of Jesus Christ, our Master, our Savior, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, I can, I can express love towards, somebody, towards one another in the body of Christ, but if it's actually going to come out of my heart and the manifested presence of God's glory is on me, that will result in miracles. 
It'll result in the moving of the gifts of the Spirit, which is not for my benefit, it's for the benefit of the flock that I've been assigned to teach. Those are the words of Jesus. Now, in the, in the, in the general epistle of James, and most theologians consider this a general epistle, because even though he writes it, and he says to the tribes scattered abroad, this probably was written to be a circular letter to go throughout the church to the Hebrews, the Jews, that must have left Jerusalem after Stephen's persecution, uh, the dispersion. And James, at this point, he's the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Now this is James, the half-brother of Jesus. So I'm going to read what he wrote, but I want you to keep in mind, in his opening salutation, in verse 1, he writes, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have very rarely ever heard a younger brother give that type of an opening introduction to his older brother. <laughs> Jesus' brothers thought he was crazy at one time. So James has come a long way. Now in verse 8 through 13, in chapter 2, James is going to show us that the whole law is to be fulfilled, and that includes mercy and, as well as justice. He's going to write that and lay that out by inspiration of God in chapter 8 through 13. And th this backdrop is important <coughs> because when you hear verse 8, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. So James writes that. Jesus gave us John chapter, chapter um, 13, verse 35. Now, what is the royal law? That's part of it. It's the great commandment. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34, and you can reference Deuteronomy chapter 6 in the Old Testament. Then we have Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, where Jesus is going to talk about the Good Samaritan. And that parable, that set of verses that Jesus gives us, is what James is talking about in chapter 2 because he's going to reference he's going to in verse 14, 15 and 16 his examples of fulfilling this part of the royal law you shall love your neighbor as yourself he calls it good works he's, he's starting to try to get us to understand that I'll show you my faith by the works that I do. But when you look at what those two works are in that scripture set of verses, it's going to mirror what we're going to see in the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's somebody doing something out of love for their neighbor. Now, chapter 13, verse 1 to 13 Last week I said, I, I call this myself the way of love. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the, what, life. Well, he's going to give us instructions. The Word of God is going to give us instructions here. And I want to give this to you in the Amplified Classic. I got through some verses in the King James last week, but this is going to open this up and amplify it some. If I can speak 
in the tongues of men and even of angels, but have not love, that reasoning, intentional, spiritual devotion, such as is inspired by God's love for and in us, I am only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I speak in the wisdom of men, the words of men, and the tongues of angels, even angels, but the love of God is not evident in me, I'm just a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, I'm going to repeat that because there, a lot of people are calling them prophets today. If I have prophetic powers, and if I have this in addition to that, that's how I read that, I have prophetic powers, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, and understand all the secret truths and mysteries, and possess all knowledge, and if I have sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains, great faith, but have not love, God's love in me, I am nothing. I'm a useless nobody. Now, I, when I read these scriptures, when I meditate on them, I make this personal and I put my name in here. This morning when I was praying, I thought, if I remove mountains and cast them into the sea, if I have that great faith, if I raise the dead, if I walk on water, if I multiply five loaves and two fishes to feed 5,000 men plus the others with them, but God's love is not manifested in me, I'm a nobody. I'm nothing. Even if I dole out all that I have to the poor in providing food, and if I surrender my body to be burned, or in order that I may glory, but have not love, God's love in me, I gain nothing. I can feed every orphan and vulnerable child on the face of the earth, as far as north is from south and east is from west. And unless there's love manifested in me, God's love, agape love, I don't gain a thing. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy. Is not boastful or vainglorious. Does not display itself haughtily. This is important. Because I know a lot of pastors that don't operate in the gifts of the Holy Ghost. They think they do, but they don't have an understanding because they have not been taught. And it will be interesting if I would be asked to teach this to them and some of the congregation, their faith rose up and because the love of God was spread abroad in their heart, began to operate in the gifts, are those pastors going to be jealous and not allow that person to operate and minister to people by the divine gifting that is for the church? That's just a question. It is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. It is not rude, unmannerly, and does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way. For it is not self-seeking. 
It's not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffering wrong. It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. So if you want to stand fast, stand on that wall and stand fast on the Word of God, how are you going to do it? you got to have God's love in you to that extent where no matter what comes your way, you're going to stand. Is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances and it endures everything without weakening. Love never fails. You're going to see when a believer in Jesus Christ, when the love of God is in him and now it's going to come out of him, his heart, as a river of living water, what is God going to do? Because it's not that person. Those gifts of the Holy Ghost are not that person doing them. It's God in him doing it through him because they are a vessel to be used of God. As for prophecy, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, it will be fulfilled and pass away. As for tongues, they will be destroyed and cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. It will lose its value and be superseded by truth. So knowledge is going to pass away, which is exactly why Paul would write that he wanted to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, because Christ is love and he is the truth. His words are eternal. The truth in those words obviously would be eternal. And he is love. His nature and character are eternal. (laughs) Everything else is going to pass away. For our knowledge is fragmentary, incomplete and imperfect, and our prophecy, our teaching is fragmentary, incomplete and imperfect. So if my prophecy, because I have operated in the gift of prophecy, it's prophecy given to me by God after preaching when I'm allowed to minister to people. The gifts of the Holy Spirit will flow out of me. So if that prophecy is to be used for teaching, why would James say that? Or why would Paul say that? Because in Ephesians chapter 4, he tells us what the New Testament apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher is to do. To edify the body of Christ for the work of the ministry, to equip them for the work of the ministry, for this, this is part of it, to give them the whole counsel of God, give them understanding of that, so they can go outside the walls of the church and operate in the authority in the name of Jesus and in the power by the Holy Ghost. If they're baptized in the Holy Ghost, then everybody should. The whole church should be doing this. But if the pastor doesn't know it, if the guest speaker coming in doesn't know, they can only take the congregation to the place that they live. And God forbid, God forbid you preach and you don't let the congregation of saints, the flock, be ministered to by having an altar call. That should be a That should be the standard protocol of every church service. Preach the word. Where is God going to confirm the preaching following with signs, wonders, and miracles? It's at that place. 
when that speaker starts to operate in words of knowledge and they say, there's somebody here that's tormented, they can't sleep at night, and they haven't slept for months, gotten a good night's sleep. Who is that? And they raise their hand. That's a word of knowledge. You call them up. God will heal them. And the congregation sees that. And then when you open the, when you finish preaching and open up the altar area, that's for the saints. That's not for me to gain vain glory. It's for all these people that came to hear the word of God. God will give them prophetic words. They'll know they're hearing from God because things will come out of your mouth that is not, it's not things that you know, especially if you go into the mission field like I do on missionary journeys. I, I, I've not met many of these people, most of them. If the word of God says, and God cannot lie, and he says, I will, I will confirm the preaching with signs, wonders, and miracles, you don't have to get up and prophesy that message to that congregation. What you need to do, if the message came from God and they, res and they respond it, they receive it, Father, I gave them the words that you gave to me, and they received them. They received the message. You need to, they need to be given the opportunity to respond to that message. They need to come up here, and you need to know how to operate in those gifts. And you need those testimonies so that when you tell them all the things that God used you for, that blind eyes got open, deaf ears got open, that gives your speech credibility and God's going to confirm the word he gave you to the congregation of saints. But when the complete and perfect total comes, the incomplete and imperfect will vanish, become antiquated, void, and superseded. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. Now that I have become a man, I am done with childish ways and have put them aside. I'm going to show you in a testimony, either today or Friday, two mature believers that were men that put childish thinking away and came forward in response to an altar call two Saturdays ago, and they got... They got ministered to by the Holy Ghost. For now we are looking in a mirror that gives only a dim, blurred reflection of reality, as in a riddle or enigma. But then when perfection comes, we shall see in reality and face to face. Now I know in part imperfectly, but then I shall know and understand fully and clearly even in the same manner as I have been fully and clearly known and understood by God. And so faith, hope, love, abide. Faith, conviction, and belief respecting man's relation to God and divine things. Hope, joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. It's an expectation is hope. If people come into the church expecting God to do something to them, when is he going to do it? The majority of them are going to get what they wanted. They'll, they'll hear a message, respond to it, and you've got to let them come forward. Love, true affection for God and man. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and thy neighbor as thyself, the royal law. Growing out of God's love for and in us, these three, but the greatest of these is love. So no matter what we do, at the very end, if, it, if, it's, if there's not love in it, agape love, God's divine love grown in my heart, and flowing out of my heart, my belly, as a river of life 
to minister to the saints? I'm nobody. Nobody. Now, how does this work for me anyway? Number one, I was taught how to meditate therein in the Word of God. I studied the Scriptures. I memorized the ones that command me to meditate. I got those in my heart first because once they're in your heart, you keep them there, you guard them in your heart, and you'll never not do this. If you're not meditating on God's Word, it's because you're too busy doing other things, so you're outside of the will of God in that area, because it's a commandment. Or nobody's taught you and you don't know how. Now I bet you if there was 700 pastors in this room, apostles, evangelists, and teachers, and I said, whoever knows how to meditate on God's Word, raise your hand. I bet you most of them are going to do that. And yet the majority of them are not going to have an understanding of what that means. But in that group, they're not willing to be humble and teachable and say, I need that, I don't know that. Will somebody that has that knowledge please teach me so I can be a doer of the Word? That's a contrite and humble spirit. That was number one. Number two was my prayer life. So I would see scriptures and I pray these. In spirit and truth. That's a phrase from John chapter 4, verse 24. Father, I'm asking this with faith, in faith, working with love. That's Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. I believe that. But how do I get the desires of my heart? I have to delight myself in the Lord. I have to love the Lord thy God with all my heart first, because if I do that, I'm not going to want to, I'm going to delight and rejoice in His Word, which is the truth. And Jesus is the Word. That's how you delight in the Lord. That's how you get the desires of your heart. Because if you do that, the desires of your heart are going to match God's will for everybody. That the God of our Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, may give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. And who is He? God is love. That's Ephesians 1.17. That the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. That's verse 18. These are all phrases, scriptures, parts of verses from scriptures that are in my heart. So when I pray, I'm praying the words of God back to Him. Number three, well, part of no, the, the final part of number two, I actually ask God to search my heart, the intent of my heart. Because if my motive is not right, is He going to give me the desire of my heart? Maybe it lines up with His will, but if my motive's wrong to use what I'm asking Him for, I don't know. Sometimes people's prayers don't get answered right away. There's a good reason why. Maybe your motive's wrong. The intent, the intention in your heart. Now there's a series that came out several years ago called The Chosen. <clears throat> so when I watch the first episode, there's a scene where Jesus comes out of a tavern. He, he's led there by the Holy Spirit. It's where Mar Mary Magdalene is. And she goes to have an alcoholic drink. And he walks up to her and puts his hand on her and says, that's not for you. And all of a sudden she grabs her head. I mean, the, de the demons. Remember, she had seven demons in her. They're not going to be able to handle the touch of Jesus Christ. He is the glory of the Father. That's important to hear that. 
So Mary runs out of the tavern in this scene, and Jesus walks out, and what he does is he quotes to her a scripture that her dad taught her when she was a young girl. And it stops her dead in her tracks because she's trying to run away from Jesus. And she says, who are you? And he gives the rest of the scripture. And she stands there frozen in her tracks. And he walks up to her and puts his hands on her cheeks. And under the glory of God, she just starts to look like she's melting and the demons are gone. So I saw that and I said to the Lord, I need to get to a place in the spirit where I can just put my hands on their face and they'll be healed, they'll be delivered, and the demons will just flee. Well, guess what I had to do? I had to love him with all my heart. Now, we're never going to do that on this side of the kingdom of God, of heaven. But, we, but there are people that got close. And I studied, did a, a, an in-depth study of the fruit of the Spirit, which the first one is love. Now, here's some of the testimonies, and I'm going to start with this one in the beginning because Pastor Mike was preaching one day, and he gave a challenge to the congregation. He said, if you want to begin to go to another level, I don't remember exactly how he worded it, I challenge you to spend 10 days in nothing but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels. And it was like God was speaking to me. So when I left, it was a Sunday, I said, God, I'm going to take that challenge. So Monday, when I got up, now I have what's called my eye Bible. It's the audio Bible, and I also have from a company called Lionsgate, the title of this series is called Lionsgate Presents a Lumo Project. So the Lumo Project was they did a word-for-word unedited movie adaption of all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, same people, They were Middle Eastern actors. There's a narrator. I think they were filmed in Morocco, so it looks like the Middle East. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So Monday I get in my vehicle and I drive an hour and a half and I'm listening on an audio Bible what I can only get through half of the Gospel of Matthew. But on the way home, I listened to the second half. So I've just heard the entire Gospel of Matthew. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. When I got home, I ate dinner and I sat down and I put the Lumo Project, the Gospel of Matthew, unedited word for word the Bible on. So now I'm watching and I'm hearing it again. Tuesday, I did the same with the Gospel of Mark, Wednesday with the Gospel of Luke, and Thursday with the Gospel of John. Now, I'm going to give you some statistics. The Gospel of Matthew, word for word, unedited, that I'm watching or listening to, is three hours and 15 minutes long. The Gospel of Mark, two hours and one minute. The Gospel of Luke, three hours and 20 minutes. And the Gospel of John, two hours and 30 minutes. Now that's watching it in the evening. So if I multiply that by two, 
That means on Monday, I listened to twice and watched once the unedited Gospel of Matthew for six hours and 30 minutes out of my day. On Tuesday was four hours with Mark. On Wednesday was six hours and 30 minutes spent with Luke. And on Thursday was five hours spent with John. In four days, I was eating and drinking. I was eating the flesh. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in me. God's life, Zoe life. In four days, I was immersed in 22 hours of the Gospels. And then I repeated that the next four days. That meant by the eighth day, I spent 44 hours <laughs> in the four Gospels. 44 hours in eight days. That's better than 50% of your day in, in the Gospels. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. Now on the ninth day, I spent the day pondering, thinking about, meditating on what I had heard and what I had seen. And on the tenth day, when I got up in the morning, I thought to myself, people got healed. They got healed for several reasons. First and foremost, they came to Jesus like the woman with the issue of blood, knowing they came knowing that if they could get to Jesus, they would be healed. There's the expectation. That's faith. That's great faith. They knew in their heart that they would be healed if Jesus would lay hands on them. Just speak the word. You don't even have to come to my house, said the centurion. The next thing that happened was their faith moved compassion in Jesus. He was moved by that faith. And then he said, be healed according to your faith, or thy faith has healed you, woman. Now on that tenth day, I go, my wife has a house in the city of Baltimore at this time, and I'm still, I'm living in Gettysburg. She's going to move up when the house gets sold. She's cooking dinner, and <clears throat> she's in pain. She turns around and says, Honey, when we are done eating, will you please lay hands on me and pray over my back? I'm in pain. What she had was what's called a herniated disc. Now, if you go look that up in a medical book, you're going to get, <laughs> you're either going to, you're either going to say, wow, or you're going to run away. But it doesn't matter. Jesus was raising people from the dead, and he walked on water. He commanded the wind and the sea to stop. That, that same Jesus lives in you. I just spent 44 hours and another eight the next day, that's 52 hours meditating in the Gospels, and that's what the Lord was showing me. That's what I got out of that 52 hours with Him. That was the price I had to pay. Now here's what happened. I said yes. I sit down at the dinner table, and it looks like the pain is increasing in her back. However, I am in perfect peace. The woman that I love, 
that I love is in front of me in excruciating pain and I'm in peace. What does that mean? It means I'm operating in the kingdom of heaven here on earth. The kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The peace of Christ that passes all understanding. I'm not panicked or anything. I looked up to heaven and I said, Father, your son, they came to your son to be healed with that expectation and that faith moved the compassion of Jesus Christ. I get it. So now I got a revelation. Now that reality in the scriptures is alive in me. It's not it's a it's a rhema word. It's not a logos word. It's now living word in me, ready to become alive. God cannot lie. So her back collapses, and she stands up from the chair, and she's bent over. And when I looked up and, and said, my wife just came to Jesus to be healed, not me. And as soon as I said that, compassion rose up out of my heart. Tears are streaming down my face. That's the manifested glory of God, visibly seen. I walked over to her, put my hand on her, in Jesus' name be healed. And she shot straight up, and the power of God basically blew her into the table. What happened? The love of God began to be manifested in me. The power of divine love, I didn't think. I just did. Because I was so deep in meditating on God's words... Now remember, I spent more than a day, two days, meditating on what I just listened to and saw for eight days. So if you go listen to your audio Bible for eight hours a day, and you're not meditating, that word is a Logos word. It's not living in you. It's not in your heart yet. So my wife's herniated disc got healed on day 10. Now I'm going to give you one more testimony that happened recently. We have to be in season and out of season. If you're a teacher of the Word of God, how... How is that supposed to work? I have to hear from God what He wants me to learn that week. I have to spend time with Him, and when I do, because I expect it, I get divine downloads, so I get the message. But then I have to meditate on it. I can only speak in an hour on the overflow of what I learned during the week. This is important. So Pastor Mike calls me and says, Brother Pete, I don't want to put pressure on you. You know, it, it's 4 o'clock, but the, two, the, the 6 p.m. speaker isn't going to show up. Can you do that service? I'm not going to ever say no. I'm not going to say no because it's the house of God and I'm a teacher of the Bible. And if now i got to step in and fill that gap, I don't want to say no because I'd be saying, no, God, I don't want to come and teach your flock. That's how I look at that in my heart. It was a healing service. So we had worship music. It wasn't loud. It was nice to bring in the Spirit of God. And I was in in a healing service. We're we're only going to preach 20 minutes. 
I got up and delivered the message God gave to me. Part of the message was asking the people, because we sang some worship songs about the glory of God coming in. So the worship music led to the preaching. I, did, I had no idea what the worship team was going to play, but every one of their songs was tied directly to the message God gave me when I was nowhere near them. It's one spirit. That meant the worship team heard from God what they were supposed to play, and I got confirmation I got the right message because I'm listening to the worship music, and it's the lead into the message. But part of the message was three of the titles of Jesus Christ. Healer, now this is a healing service. Healer of hearts. That's one of his titles. Healer of souls. That's one of the titles for Jesus Christ. One of his names, one of his titles. Healer of wounds. That came out in the message. So when I was done preaching, I had declared, because the Lord told me, when you get up to preach, I want you to ask me, this is, this is him speaking to me, Peter, I want you to look up to me, raise your arms up in the air, and kneel down in front of the congregation, and I want you to ask me in faith for me to pour out my power and glory that my people see the manifested glory of me, that they can receive what I want to do for them. And I did that in faith that works with love. Normally, people are going to come forward for physical healing. But when they heard healer of hearts, what happened was, and these were two mature people, men, one of them a little older than me and one just a little younger than me. But without hesitating, one of them came right up to me, stood in front, I stood right here on this gold line, and they stood where I could touch them like that, and tears came down out of his face. And what he said to me was, my heart's broken over the death of my son. Now the love of God spread abroad in your heart should respond to that, right? Blessed, is, blessed are those that mourn for the mournful. So the love of God rose up out of me and tears came out of my eyes. I mean, I felt, I felt this man's brokenheartedness for his son. I mean, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, what would I do if that happened to my son? And what happened was, I spoke a few words to him and he looked at me weeping and I just looked at him and I said, brother, I love you. God loves you. And I hugged him and he wrapped his arms around me. And what happened was what I asked Jesus three years ago. I just want to hug them or put my hands on their face and have them set free. And it was the love of God in a believer that preached the truth and gave the people the opportunity to come up here and let God confirm his words with signs, wonders, and miracles. Love never fails. He looked at me, and now most men would be ashamed to do this. Remember that scripture when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, 
I acted as a child. This person was not acting like a child. They heard a message from God and they need something from God. So what happened? He looked at me and he smiled. And he said, thank you, brother, I needed that. And I said, brother, I did nothing. That was God. And we still had tears, but the tears of mourning. Now, he was still mourning the loss of his son, but God internally in his heart reached out and touched him and reduced that on that person. Now, when I closed in prayer, I remember now by the Spirit, I said, Lord, don't let anybody leave here the same as we came in. That was a prophetic word without me knowing it. That's moving in the gifts. I spoke that. It just came out of me. It was was a divine message from God speaking through me, and then it happened there. That man wasn't going to leave the same. There was a man standing behind him. We call them catchers. Because he was expecting the power of God to hit him because he saw the manifested glory of God on me. And when that happens, you don't force that person to stand up. You need to gently lay them down because God's going to minister to them. They just fell out under the glory of God and they'll start weeping and then laughing. Sometimes just weeping. But God's doing something in them and and if you touch them, you're getting in the way. These are all things that we teach here at Jesus is Lord. I was taught. Freely that was given to me and my pastor wants people to mentor to. So he taught me how to, how to freely give what I was given. So this man gets ready to leave and now he's sitting down and he's at peace because I asked too for peace to come over him. The peace brought, it, it, probably, it might not have been joy, Peace came upon him. The love of God brought the peace without understanding for somebody mourning for the loss of a son. That's got to be a horrible thing for a parent to have to bury a child. Well, the man that was the catcher stepped up to me and he started to weep. And he said, Brother Pete, I've had a I've had quite a week. It started out in joy and it finished in grief and mourning and I lost a grandchild. And he just started to weep. And I just, it, it just came out of me. I said, brother, that's got to be terrible. And I, I, I said, I, I, I feel your grief. And I started to mourn with him. And the same thing happened. He hugged me, and the love of God brought peace upon him. There was no yelling. There was no screaming. They had hands laid on them, but it was a hug. The love of God rose up in me, and those two people that lost a child and a grandchild, because I asked for peace to come upon them, God honored that. It was because the intent in my heart, remember the prayer, search my heart and the intent of my heart. And I said, God, it's the desire of my heart for peace to come upon him. And it did. And we left the service, the three of us together, in peace. No more weeping. Now they were still going to grieve, but they had peace on them. That's peace that passes all understanding. The world would look at that and accuse those two men, adult men, of being hard-hearted, and yet it was the peace of Christ, the divine peace of Christ, that came upon them through the love of God that came out of me, 
because of what I just said that I did for, for these years. Now, Friday at 2 o'clock, I'm going to pick this up. That's only two testimonies. And I'm taking these testimonies slowly because I was asked if I could put some together for Pastor Mike to use in his book. And the more that I started to ask God to bring them to my remembrance, there was too many of them for me to get through in one meeting. I don't even know if I can get through them in Friday, but there'll be enough of them. So Friday, I'll open in prayer. I'm going to give you the scriptures that we spoke about today. I'm not going to read 1 Corinthians to you, but I'll give the, a couple of key scriptures to you because you have to hear the word of God. But I would encourage you to go listen back to this message, and then most of the message on Friday is going to be testimonies. And it'll be an hour of testimonies, just like these two miracles. Nothing but that. God's love, because love never fails. And that I'll close on. So Father, I thank you for these words. The messages you give to me are always for me, for my growth, and then I get to share them. And I thank you for the privilege to stand behind the pulpit in this house of God, a house of God that believes that God will confirm the preaching with signs, wonders, and miracles. And Lord, I ask that you let us, whether we're here or watching through modern technology, let the testimonies that were given ignite a fire in our hearts to pursue the love of God, that we want the love of God manifested in our lives so that we can help people, because we can't do it without your love, without you, because you are love. And I know I just prayed your will, so I thank you for listening, and I thank you for I thank you for answering this prayer, and I ask in Jesus' name, amen.